I never say goodbye to this place. Well, by the way, we're sitting on top of the pump room parking ramp. There's absolutely no evidence the place ever existed, except for a few of us. And uh, we're gonna make breakfast. So <laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, the old pump room, we had a hell of a good time. And uh, <clears throat> we, we misbehaved most of our lives. Uh, and uh, so here, here's, here's the pomp room breakfast. First of all, you get your plates out, and then you, yeah, start out with a little, a little. Uh, we got the, the grill started, so here's the grill. It looks like tomato juice, but uh, it's uh, trust me. So uh, we got the egg going. Time to get a little bacon out. <clears throat> Here's the bacon. It looks like blue ribbon, but it's bacon. Bacon in a cup. There you go. So I have one for me. And then, uh, that, that, see how I said, yeah. I love eggs. If I ask you, are you, uh, are you a reliable narrator in telling the story of the pomp room? I guess I am. I guess I know as much about it as anybody that's alive. Uh, you know, and of course, everybody's version is a little different. I guess I'm as reliable as anybody. I've talked to people since then that were just afraid to ever go to the pop room, and you know what? They really missed out. A dive bar that was like the pit of Sioux Falls, and at the same other extreme was the most beautiful place for a musician to go hang out. But it was a bar bar. It wasn't a fancy sports bar like we have now. This was a bar bar. This is where people went to drink. Big, nasty, macho thing that you saw from the outside, and once you got to know it, it was just a teddy bear. And it was so loud and so like you felt it in your guts. I knew it was a magical time and I knew that it wasn't gonna last forever. We liked rock and roll. Just imagine no logic, no reason, and no consequence. In 1970, Fairfax, South Dakota, were cattle outnumbered people 13 to 1. With five children in the house, Duane and Jeannie Ertz were searching for ways to keep the family ranch alive. Surprising many, their solution was to buy a bar 144 miles away in Sioux Falls, the state's largest city. No one, including their sons John and Ward, could have imagined the legacy and the family that would be created by a little club called the Pomp Room. Yeah, I'm John Ertz. Uh, Mom and Dad bought the Pomp Room. I was 14 years old and uh, we had a blast. Picture from 1958 and uh, the sign then says the Pump Room. And a, a man named Chris Miller had opened it. I don't think he was very old at that point. He actually had a picture of him pulling the U out, putting the O in, because the Ambassador Hotel in Chicago has a very uh, beautiful main floor bar, brass tables and everything, and uh, that's the pump room. And so they were told they could not use that name any longer. So Chris Miller, in about 66, uh, sold the pump room at that point to a man named Dale Dean. The, we bought it from Dale in um, April 1st, April Fool's Day in 1971. Mom and Dad decided to quit raising cows. Well, they didn't really, they never quit raising cows. Uh, we couldn't make any money raising cows. So we figured, well, why not run a bar in Sioux Falls? 
they didn't have bands at first. And I was always wanting to go in there. So what's pomp mean? You know, what's that? What's pomp? It must be something important or elegant or whatever, because it's got this <laughs> medieval guy blowing on a <laughs> trumpet. It wasn't very big. I think we held 200 for capacity, maybe a little less. But um, there was the, the front room and in the middle room, which had a very small stage, the size of a drum riser of today. In fact, the size of a small drum riser of today. And then there was a, a small dance floor. And then you went to the back and there was a pool room back there, two pool tables and a foosball, and a foosball table. My friends took me to the bars that had live music, and uh, the band that got up and played was definitely country. And I walk up to the bartender and I said, hey, I said, these new Warners, any chance they're gonna be changing this to a rock bar? And the guy looked at me and he goes, well, I rather doubt it. So we stayed away for a while, and then, Jeannie and Dwayne Ertz made so many good decisions. They decided to make it a rock bar. If you had old long hair and you kind of like rock and roll and you were still uh, kind of in the hippie generation, you know, in the early 70s yet, you know, from the Woodstock era, uh, they were accepting of that. And I found it, I don't know, not odd, but neat that uh, Jeannie and Dwayne would so-called put up with these type of people and allow them to come in and play this loud rock and roll music at the time. Well, I was 71. By 73, uh, the competition is getting pretty crazy and we're losing business. So we have this, we have a decision to make. And uh, we all sat down and the decision was made to expand the place and the building to the south of us was available and we opened up in March of 73 to the upstairs. Expanding, probably doubling our size. I went to work uh, June 4th, 1973. And after that day, the first day of work, I thought I should have a beer to celebrate one day. And I stopped at a place three blocks down the road called the Pomp Room. And Dwayne and Jeannie, they liked me. That relationship went on until 74 and they needed a lawyer and they hired me and I, I was their lawyer from 1974 until eons later. So about five o'clock is when all of your people, all your attorneys and, and all those guys from the courthouse would come down, their secretaries and their receptionists. All the working guys from Lock Electric would come in for happy hour. I think happy hour was from like five to seven. And it was two furs, of course. So. I mean, you would take out loads of drinks, as many as you could carry, because you had glass bottles, you had glass glasses. Any call beer, which was Budweiser, Miller, Grain Belt beer, Schmidt beer, and of course, Blue Ribbon. That was what was in the bins behind the bar. Those were 60 cents a bottle. The well drinks were 65 cents, and Jack Daniels was the highest charged for drink at the time, and it was 75 cents a drink. Music was as important to the pomp room as the drinks themselves. Clubs generally booked house bands that would play multiple sets a night for months at a time. The pomp room was no exception. In those days, uh, uh, Bill Prines from Choosy Music was the name of his band, and Rod Jerky, uh, Priceless was the band. They were playing for us. They would do... Eight, nine months at a time as our house band, Monday through Saturday. Hey, would you guys be interested in playing in this, you know, we have a small place and we're trying to change it over from, you know, old time stuff to, and we said, sure, why not? You know, sounds like fun. <laughs> so <laughs> we were one of the first bands to change it from the old time stuff to rock. It was okay. a sit down, you know, house band kind of thing. This, Different. <laughs> yeah, this was in, I believe, June of 74. Tiny little stage in the corner, and we changed that <laughs> because uh, it, there was no room for us. We tried to fit on there, and we couldn't, and finally we went to Dwayne and said, hey, um, if you buy the materials, we'll build the stage for you so we can make, make it to fit, you know. And, and he said, sure, no problem. So he brought in two-by-fours and plywood and all that kind of stuff and got some carpeting and, and uh, created the stage. The, the crowds were great. You know, it would be, the weekends especially, they'd be packed. We played six nights a week, five sets a night. Yeah. And you'd see some of those people in there every night. 
we probably hold the record with Priceless for, we played there for thir 13 or 14 months in a row, every night, every week. Played there for over a year. Got us a gig at the Pomp. And we started in June, summer of 74. It was a real meat market when we played there. A lot of groping, gripping, grasping, flirting, honking, sweating. And that was just the band. The bands were amazing. So that's the best part of the pomp room is that they always had music and dancing. and Anything you could dance to. I mean, yeah. we were a dance band. If yeah. you couldn't, I mean, I'm a, at my heart, I'm a dancer. So if you couldn't dance to it, yeah. we wouldn't do it. We probably picked up six or seven new songs every week. Yeah. Just because we had to keep things fresh and everything. If there was something on the jukebox that was kind of new or whatever, that people were playing a lot, <laughs> that would go on the rehearsal schedule, you know. In 76, we built the part that the, would eventually contain the new stage, but not for years. Uh, we added that on, probably again doubling our capacity. Uh, at that point, we were at about 600. It was Labor Day of 77. We opened up the, the, the bar on the very, very north end. So 77, we do the last expansion. At that point, we're holding about 750 people, 748, I think. After about the first four, four and a half years, the clientele being mid-20s into 50s, um, going back, dropping down to 21, 22, 23 years old, when Jeannie and Duane decided to move on from house bands. They worked with a couple promoters, and we got in different bands, which you know was not going to, would not at the time have appeased the typical 40-year-old. So we had a much more youthful clientele that came in in that time frame. They changed the bands up every week. It was the same band every night. So if you liked them, it was a good week, and if you didn't like them, it was a long week. Dwayne and Jeannie Ertz were wonderful people, kind, generous, understanding. She wasn't stern, that's not really the word, but I mean, she she said what she said, you did what she said. It's yeah. just, and she expected it. She scared the hell out of a lot of people. You know, she's short, nice looking, you know, older gal, but she could just be quick to tongue to rip you wide open. She was a mean old gal when you crossed her the wrong way. Jeannie and Dwayne were the best people ever. I mean, they would have done anything for you. She ran a pretty tight ship, I'd say. She didn't really put up with too much. About one o'clock, she'd allow us to each have a shot. <laughs> that was it for the night. Jeannie did so many things for so many of those, you know, ne'er-do-wells, people that didn't have a lot. Again, Jeannie was tough. You didn't cross her, but boy, she she took care of family. She and, she and Dwayne. Dwayne never spoke. But when he did, that was it. No discussion, done. Before Dwayne and Jeannie would give you a free beer, they'd make your house payment. <laughs> yeah, that's could... Hands down, this is a fact. Yeah, she's like your mom or something, you know? You didn't get that on the road. But they were, they understood musicians. They got it. Disco may have been king as the 80s approached, but it wasn't royalty in the pomp room. The music at the pomp actively resisted the disco swell by embracing music that was harder, louder, better. Disco in the mid-70s was clobberous. Most of the bands we had were still playing top play radio stuff, which had shifted into much more disco than rock. So we decided to shift to the heavier side of the music, and that is probably uh, the very, very late 70s. Still radio play, but a heavier version of it. Departure from the disco and what was top 40 at the time. Dwayne and Jeannie uh, came and listened to us, and they said, okay, you can come down and play. We got in there and we played a few times. It was really a lot of fun, I enjoyed that. I, I thought, this is, this is what I'd like to do, play play music in front of people. You know, if you think right now of a band going into a bar and playing Monday through Saturday, three sets a night, that's crazy. You didn't hear a lot of original music, 
if somebody would have an original song here and there, most of it was coming straight off the radio. In the 80s, local rockers like Flat Cat, Wakefield, and Scanner were regulars at the pump. But Duane and Jeannie weren't afraid to mix it up. The twisted new wave sounds of the Nitro Brothers, the occasional national act like Tora Tora or Starwolf, even oiled male dancers. The bar had firmly established a rock and roll reputation where you never knew what might happen next. That's when we moved into the biker era. I remember one time we drove up to load equipment in, there was like, I don't know, 30 bikes, you know, and I'm going, okay, what kind of place are we playing at? All the way down the block, motorcycle, 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 motorcycle. You knew that mostly when you walked in the bar, besides the smell of smoke, it'd be a lot of the smell of leather. And if I had a dollar for every time we played <laughs> low rider. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. She's doing the harmonica part on the melodica. The little yeah. melodica, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes five, six times a night, I'm going, oh, really mm. people, again? They weren't allowed to wear their colors in the bar, so that was an issue sometimes too. There was a lot of ugly people in there that you didn't want to mess with. You heard of bikers hung out there, you know, metalheads, you know, there was fights and, you know, arrests and ambulances occasionally. <laughs> I mean, like any bar, you put alcohol and stupid people together and you're going to have fights. You know, I think everybody was kind of there for the music and to hang out, but some people don't handle alcohol well. And so it was, you know, people got thrown out. It was just part of the thing. If you went down there and you were looking for trouble, probably someone would help you out with that. But if you weren't, I never, like one time I think some guy tried to pick a fight with me and I just walked away. And that's in, you know, uh, you know, many years of going down there. So it, it really wasn't that big of a deal. My mom and dad's best line was, Johnny, don't get in a fight. And then as soon as there was a fight, I said, Johnny, go break that up. I said, I thought you told me not to get in a fight. I remember there were two girls on the floor fighting. I went, oh, for God's sake. So I set my tray down. And I reached down and grabbed that one. I said, not in here. And I grabbed it. And there were still two girls on the floor fighting. <laughs> I went, that was my first threesome. <laughs> In all my years of going to the pomp room, and I was there during the 80s, things were a lot more rowdy. I only saw one fight, and it wasn't even really a fight. It was the bouncers taking the guy out the door. I saw some doozies. I mean, you can't, you can't put aggressive rock and roll and alcohol together <laughs> without having some sort of, of problems on a Saturday night after too much alcohol. That's right. But I'm watching these two guys, and all of a sudden, they, they go from laughter and laughter, and they're giggling, and, and all of a sudden, one of them grabs his beer bottle and cranks up and smokes the other guy right here in the head with it. Glass busts everywhere. The dude goes, boom, doesn't go down. Stands up, picks up his chair, and goes, wham! <laughs> he won. <laughs> Most people didn't want any trouble at the pomp room. For those that did, there was one solution, pomp security. Over the years, Pokey, Harry, Jason, Big Dave, and Ma, and others were on site to deal with those that broke the law. Well, pomp room law anyway. Disputes didn't usually last very long. I can remember there'd be fights and the, you know, Ma and Harry, those guys break it up, and Ma would lay him on the ground and sit on him out in front of the bar waiting for the cops. Shut up. <laughs> Just wait for the cop. Most people would leave willingly and without too much trouble, but if they started fighting back or beating up the employees, that didn't usually end well for them. I had a lot of friends down there looking out for me, uh, and a lot of times, I mean, I went to the emergency room a lot. Um, I had a bottle busted in the back of my head, bottle busted in my face, a few other places. Um, I was never shot or stabbed. Uh, I probably spent, I don't know how much time in courtrooms, sometimes as a witness and sometimes as a defendant. The law business with Pomp Room as a client was an adventure. <laughs> People were picking up pool cues and I'm sure two or three people, as I recall, it got knocked out. He got punched, and he was like Gumby. He went down, but he did. He came back up, and at that point, I'm thinking, okay, I was. I went. I went over and called the cops. Well, it was. It was probably about 
three to five minutes of just everybody fighting, and then they all went out the front door, and maybe a minute later, they all came back in for round two and kicked the ass again. But I would say the Palm Room definitely lost that fight. There's always yeah. stories flying around about the Palm Room and how, how bad it was, and you go in there and somebody's going to kick your ass or something, you know? And, <laughs> and, but at the same time, there was also the stories going around where, well, that's where there's a band every night, you know? And, that's where all the really good local bands play the pomp room, you know. The good regional bands, they get gigs at the pomp room. It turned from being a scary place to being the cool place to hang out. Uh, when I was, was first started going there, it was still the scary place. I mean, I remember seeing Johnny Ertz coming down the steps after getting a beer bottle broke over his head, bleeding, saying, Get that guy out of here! And then, you know, I'm sitting there in my button-down shirt and tie from Citibank going, what am I doing here? I had one guy in there one night when I was waitressing, and he was kind of a, being kind of a jerk, and I probably wasn't taking it so well. And, and I don't know if he, I don't even remember for sure if he knocked a drink out of my hand or if he grabbed me or what, but the whole bar just stood up. I mean, everybody was leaning on the bar, and, he, and the whole, and that was just kind of a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. I went, all right, I can take this one level farther because they got my back. <laughs> we were all family. We always watched out for each other. My mother was terrified when I told her I would be playing at the pomp room. And I said, Mom, that is the safest place on earth for me to be. You know, I never worried about my safety at that place, ever. I felt safer there than I did driving there or driving back or in my own home, really. Because I, anybody would have gotten their ass kicked if they would have messed with any of the family. Whether you worked at the pomp room, whether you were in a, uh, a customer of the pomp room, and working at the pomp room, cocktailing, bartending, the bands, no matter what it was, you became family almost instantly. And even though the genres of music changed over the years, the type of clientele changed over the years, the one thing that never left was that family feeling. The weirdest dysfunctional family, and as big as it could get, you know, some of the members you liked, some of them you didn't, but it was a, you know, it was a family. Dwayne and Jeannie at the front bar. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And uh, there was at least one or two drinks there, and then you'd wander through the back, uh, get a drink from Rick Lighthizer at the far back bar, and then up the stairs to the bar across from the stage where it was normally Johnny Art, the, the loud guy, and yes, and then way down at the other end, you'd go for shots with, uh, with Snoop and Sue, naturally. It was, it was a great place to go see great bands, and you walked in, and it was like you never left. You'd, you'd go away for three months on the road with a band traveling, and you'd come back, and it was like you'd walked out the night before and walked right back in. It was home. It's home. It's a place to go, whether you're a musician, a crew guy. You know, if you know anything or into anything about the music scene, you know. It was my home away from home. I used to live there, practically. There's some clubs you go into where you, as, as the band, you know, they've got some band just left, and here you are coming in behind them. You have no idea how that band treated that bar or the people in it. So there was a level of respect that we had for the places we were playing, and we eventually developed and got back from them because of that. But a lot of times you go into these clubs and you're instantly there. They're reading you the riot act. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. But you have to go on at this time. You're going to get docked for this. You didn't get that at the bomb room ever. It was the crowd. It was the bartenders. It was the bouncers. You know, I mean, <laughs> the, there was a lot of personalities in that place. And there's a, there are a million stories and a million characters, and you just can't believe some of the stuff that went on that you saw and some of the stuff that you heard and, you know, some of the stuff that was spoken of in hushed and reverent tones. More bands, more drinks, more people. With live music every night, the next step was to have a place for touring bands to crash. The house next door to my mom and dad's house on 33rd Street was available. Uh, mom and dad bought it. My mother had talked to the agencies, and a lot of the agencies had a huge problem with band houses because they're not very well kept, and uh, other things happen, and there's some legal problems, and uh, we won't go into that. Mom says, why don't you just come take a look? And they walked in and said, you're kidding. This is the band house? She said, yeah. She goes, well, this is fine. 
and we'll be fine with this. We had no idea. And, uh, and, and we had that reaction quite a bit. And my mother took good, good care of it. And you know, they put them up in this house. You guys come and play our bar uh, Monday through Saturday, and you get paid whatever you get paid, and you get this house. And coming in from out of town, you always appreciated a house. It was cool because you had a kitchen. You could, you could cook as many ramen noodles as you wanted. You didn't have to eat out. It was cool. Uh, but they had rules that they didn't want you having anybody over. And we were like, you know, the Urches were so cool that you you didn't want to break those rules at the band house. You just didn't. Well, we were supposed to be doing parties. <laughs> and uh, we, I, anyway. In 1988, the days of 3-2 beer ended when South Dakota adopted a minimum drinking age of 21. Bars and venues whose motto was based around 3-2 beer closed their doors. That was fine with the pomp room since it meant less competition and more customers coming in for live music. It also didn't hurt that ID checks at the door could sometimes be pretty flexible. You know, you had to be 21 to get in, so <laughs> I waited till I was 19. And, uh, and I just went there with a lot of uh, friends, and it was a rough club at that point. They, they didn't really card us that much at the pomp room, and so we, in high school, could sneak in and watch these cool bands. We wanted to play the pop room because we wanted to be like those guys. And not just like those guys, but we wanted to actually get out of Sioux Falls. I mean, we wanted to go tour like these guys were doing, you know? And, and after really 3-2 beer, that whole industry disintegrated. I mean, they didn't have the big booking agencies that had 150 bands. You know, they didn't have all the ballrooms went under. It was just this whole industry that existed before 80, you know, late 80s that after the 80s wasn't around anymore. Times were also changing for the Ertz family. As the 90s approached, Dwayne went back to the ranch, but Jeannie remained behind the bar. It was time for the family business to transition to the next generation, sons John and Ward. John had been working at the bar since he was a teenager. His younger brother Ward went to college before returning to the pump. Both were dedicated to keeping the pomp room rocking, but their personalities were very different. John would do anything for you. He really, really will do anything for you if, if you're in need. He would give the shirt off his back to anybody, I think, but he is the human megaphone, man. He's just the human loudspeaker. God love him. And, uh, and Ward, you know, when he took over management of it, uh, he really gave more of a direction to that bar than it had previously had. Jeannie kind of phased herself out a little bit and Ward mm -hmm. kind of took over the management of it, you know. Ward, considerably more quiet, <laughs> considerably more business-like. Um, again, would, you know, I think help anybody out of a jam. John is one of those guys that if, if he were a child today, we would say he has ADHD. He can't sit still. He can't not be doing something. So the pomp room was a great place for John because there was always something needed to be fixed. And, you know, they, they brought in this huge PA. It was an old pile of junk PA. So John was constantly fixing it and working on it. He was constantly putting lights together, making the house light rig so it was there. I remember John, because he was always around, man. He was, he was like the guy that kind of he was, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you'd call him, you'd almost call him like if you were a touring band, he'd, he was like the road manager, the tour manager, always around. You had a problem, you went to John. He had, he'd take care of it. John built a lot of stuff. And I remember the lighting console, the Urtzicon. I Maybe there was a number after it, I don't know. But I remember that very, very well. Well, John, you knew where you stood. With, with Ward, you never really knew what was going on in his head. With Ward, you socialized with him in the element at, at the pomp room. But with John, you celebrated life with him everywhere. <laughs> Whether you wanted to or not. But it was always so funny, the dynamic between Ward and John, with Ward being so uh, kind of responsible in planning and different things, and John just kind of being off the cuff running at stuff. It, I, I, don't, I can't count the amount of times I'd walk into the bar and and one of the first things Ward would say, did you hear what my, my fucking brother did? <laughs> <laughs> and then you just kind of make this shake like, yeah, it'll be a Christmas, we love him. 
I mean, Ward was cool, but he had kind of seemed like he had a business to run, you know, <laughs> and uh, just a little more straight laced. Some, you know, and John was just nuts, man, just crazy. Whether he knew how to do it or not, yeah. he would he would tackle it, and that's yeah. you know that's really yeah. applaudable. You know, I mean, that's mm -hmm. just like wow. Ward kept the numbers right. John kept the speakers running, but he also decided that the pomp room could use some happy hour music. Mark Nelson and Jeff Schwabach were pomp regulars on and off the stage. When they walked in one day wearing matching cowboy hats, John said, who do you guys think you are, the Cartwright brothers? Referring to the old Western Bonanza. John offered them the happy hour spot. The name stuck, and the result was an unexpected eruption of musical comedy. I go, look guys, we want to do, I want to do an acoustic thing during happy hour. Because it was too loud, it made all my regulars for happy hour upset and didn't like it. So I went to do something back in the corner, acoustic. I said, I'll give you a hundred bucks a week a piece and free beer. <clears throat> of course. <laughs> I probably wouldn't even had to throw in the hundred bucks, you know, because... <laughs> they wanted couple guys playing acoustic and me being a bass player and him being a keyboard player it was logical we'd take the gig. We spent the first, I would say, year of that torturing John Ertz from stage. Writing songs about him. We, yeah, we had John Ertz songs. We had, we would sing, we would slip him into everything. And until, until there were signs, he would hold up a sign that just said, help me. We got in an argument about half of the door playing for, you know, what kind of money we we're supposed to get. And John got pissy. They pissed me off. So he walks out in the middle of the dance floor, sets a sawhorse up, goes in the back room, gets another sawhorse, comes out with a skill saw, puts it down, runs power off the stage while we're playing and doing all this stuff. <laughs> and he brings out the door off of the bathroom <laughs> and he puts it on the sawhorse. The door falls in half and hand him half the door. Here is half the door. <laughs> they were hilarious. There was something new, something different, something we hadn't seen before. So they were quite entertaining. And it didn't take long for the Cartwright brothers to become inseparable from the pomp room. It was a combination that led to a legendary Christmas tradition. Yes, that's right, Christmas. Bars had to be closed all day Christmas Day. But at midnight, they could open. So John says, well, let's have the cart race at midnight, from midnight till two. We get down there at 11 o'clock and there's people standing outside waiting to get in on Christmas night, midnight. Pop from Christmas party with the car race. That's what we're gonna do. There would be in the, in the cold on December 26th, starting at 12.01, a line a block long to get in, and they would sell at $1 drinks, not $6 drinks, eight, nine thousand dollars worth of whiskey and beer in one hour and 59 minutes. And people would bring food, and it was like a potluck, and all the staff and the friends and the crew, and we would hang out and, and then just decorate and do silly stuff, put fake fireplaces on stage and just, it was all, that was, that's what I mean by playground. We could do anything we wanted, you know? And for some reason, it breaks into a spontaneous silent night. <laughs> so everyone's singing silent night. And behind us on the bar, I see Wayne Estrada with his pants to his knees doing cartwheels behind us across the bar. Even on Christmas, the pomp room was a place where anything could and probably did happen. And the building showed it. Just the absolute worst carpet ever, ever. I don't recall the place ever being, I mean, like clean the carpet or, uh, and the bathrooms were. I feel like I'm able to handle any rock and roll concert bathroom that I ever go to because of the pomp room. You walk in and your feet stick to the floor. <laughs> you know, the bathrooms, you weren't really quite sure if you should use them or not, but later on in the night, it really didn't matter. We were all, you know, everybody was in the same boat, so to speak. Like you go in, don't touch a thing, you get out of there. I'm running lights and Johnny's running sound one night and a girl comes up to talk to John. You know, they're talking for a minute or two. And, uh, oh, okay. 
we look back down and she's still there. And she goes, John. It's like, what? He goes, I'm stuck to the floor. <laughs> Green shag carpet, I believe. Oh, yeah. That had, you know, been well, there since. It, originally, it was green shag carpet. So John goes in, gets Snoop, Mom, a bunch of people, and literally two days later strips the entire, all the carpet out, coats the floor, and he goes, there, now we can squeegee the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, I think, has a piece of it. I would be somewhat scared biologically to keep that around. I would, I would maybe keep it in a freezer. Not even perilous bathrooms and alarming carpets could keep people away from the pump. It was the place to play and experiment, making it as much fun for the bands as it was for the fans, maybe even more. It's really neat to have somebody that loved music be in charge of the bar. Yeah. You know, most of the bar owners are in there to make money, you know. They're trying, they're hiring you as a band so that they can get a bunch of people in there to make cash. And I think at the time of John and Ward, they just loved the music. I mean, I'm sure they loved being around the girls and the alcohol and, and stuff and the party, you know. But they really... Where did you see uh, that? <laughs> they, it is, they honestly did love the music. If you have a place where you can go be free to be whatever you want to be, do whatever you want to do, and be creative no matter what, it just breeds and breeds on itself and it makes all these bands come out of the woodwork. It makes for a great music scene. You have to have the playground first. And that was a great playground. I knew it was the, the place in town to play. If you had a band, that was it. So that's why I think musicians really could relate to the pop room because they really loved music and they loved musicians. They got the musician thing. They, they understood it. It had the equipment for the guys who didn't have the equipment. I mean, John had the backline gear for people who didn't have it. He had the drum kit. He had the, the amplifiers. He, he would buy a bass off somebody in the band, keep it in back, never use it. He'd lend it to anybody who needed it. It was a complete playground for creativity in its day. Being a huge music lover and live music lover, I spent hundreds of nights at the Pomp Room. It was just always an awful lot of fun and good music of all kinds. There's something about live music. I don't care if, what kind of style it is. If it's good, if you're playing it well, it's going to be good. You're going to have fun. You came in, you got yourself a beer, you got yourself a, a mixed drink. You didn't order anything. They had signs up that said, no foo-foo drinks. <laughs> You know. <laughs> we serve beer, we serve whiskey. No food food drink. Yeah, this isn't a, a drink boutique. You went up and you stood and you, you watched the band. You got to just enjoy rock and roll. The entertainment roll. wasn't always on stage, but the on stage entertainment was what got you there. Mm -hmm. there. There was more than enough entertainment, you know, otherwise. We were probably uh, the center for misbehavior for a couple of decades at least, located between the old police station and the new police station, right in the center. I, I can't say that uh, everything that happened in the pomp room was probably 100% uh, 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 upstanding. Because everybody gets smarter when they're drinking at the pomp room. And you become invisible and the cops won't see me driving on the wrong side of the street with my headlights off at 40 miles an hour. In the break room, being propositioned, uh, in the restrooms, being offered certain things. You just really never knew what was going to happen down there. Box of Dogs was playing down at the pomp room. I was running lights for them. I didn't really know what was happening until I'm in the middle of a guitar solo. So I'm on the wah pedal playing away, and I see these balls of fire going past me. The lead singer, Rain Jerky, thought it would be a great idea if in the middle of his set, he would come out with a Roman candle, light it, and take his knees, do the perfect Bon Jovi pose on his knees, and shoot it up in the air. So Rain thinks I should put it out, which is the thing to do. It was getting out of control, the thing. Starts. So he starts slamming it down on the stage, trying to put it out direction of the crowd and everybody out front. Well, I'm out front running lights. And one goes, boom, goes back and Pokey's back there. He goes, boom, 
right into Pokey's shirt. Right in the chest. Right in the chest. Pokey looks, he goes, I'm on fire. <laughs> I'm on fucking fire! Sioux Falls is in what's called flyover country. Being hundreds of miles from the nearest major metro areas made it hard for clubs to book even mid-level acts. But the pomp room used that geography to their advantage. It's called a gas stop. Um, uh, a lot of the bands go, okay, we're playing in Minneapolis, and then we're in Kansas City. We got four days off, five days off. But we got to get from Minneapolis to Kansas City. So we throw them in for a night. They do a two hour set and collect whatever they collect, fill up the tanks with fuel and beer and food, and they go on. All these bands, and literally 100 bands from like Minneapolis and Fargo and all these different places would travel around, and they would go, come through Sioux Falls and play the pomp room. Did this grouping of bars, in Kansas City here, it was a Lone Star that was super cool. It was just your consummate rock club. You go north to Omaha or Council Bluffs and you had Fat Jack's, which was a colossal place connected to a strip club. Um, you love playing there. And then you had up the road from that was the Pomp Room. So you had these three bars <clears throat> that in the mid 90s, early 90s, if you looked at your schedule and you saw that for three weeks, you're like, oh, this is gonna be fucking great, man. You just look forward to it. I mean, that little group of bars right there, you wouldn't think in the middle, right in the middle of the US, coolest bars you'll ever play. And I can say that, I can play it every state. The bad side of that, and, and this is what my little brother was faced with, is okay, we want this particular character, band, group, whatever you want to call them. And the agency says, I got a deal for you. Yeah, I'll give you this guy, but you get to take this guy, this guy, and this guy, and you got to pay them too, and they're going to play for you here, here, and here because they're coming through. And you don't make any money on the other three, you make money on the one. Some of the stuff wasn't worth putting on the stage. We did it as a favor to get the acts we wanted. Every year came with new challenges. Clearing a profit while booking bands was tough enough, but the bar's rowdy reputation was attracting consistent police attention and scorn from some residents. For regulars and staff, the reputation seemed unfair. But on October 21st, 1990, they lost one of their own. Pomp Room employee Scott Fodness was stabbed and killed outside the bar while assisting staff as they ejected two brawling customers. My friend, uh, Scott Fodness, okay, so there's a situation that got completely out of hand, and um, uh, Scott's dead, you know. Scott was such a good guy, and he thought he was doing the right thing. Bouncer rules number one, never leave the bar. Don't ever go outside. Throw the guy out, but don't go out there with him. Great guy. Yeah. Big sweetheart, giant teddy bear. Yeah. Um, do anything for you. Uh, and horrible loss. That was a miserable night. It was tragic. Um, that was that was how, when we talk about the bar exploding, um, that probably was the pinnacle of the explosion. And it's not for anything that the bar did wrong. It's from some asshole with you know, pulling a knife on somebody outside the bar. John was never the same after that. He held him in his arms. The Pomp Room family were all subpoenaed to testify. And it was a, a long, hard pull for all of them because they lost family. The tragic death of one of their own devastated the Pomp family. Under the harsh glare of the local spotlight, they tried to recover the only way they knew. Let the music play, pour the drinks, be the pomp room. That's what got them this far, and that's what attracted a whole different set of headlines thanks to one rock and roll band from Boston. <laughs> Ward gets a call, <laughs> and Aerosmith is going to be at the arena. Aerosmith wanted to do that sort of a show, a, a, a show in a... You know, a smaller town, but a, a, a bar show. 
the agent thought the pump room fit the bill. We were setting up in the afternoon and a couple dudes stopped in. We didn't know who they were, but they were asking about gear. I don't know who it was, maybe it was Ward. Someone said, oh, those guys were with Aerosmith. We're like, wow, cool, you know? I didn't know what that meant, um, but then Ward said they might stop by tonight. And I thought, yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. Plus. Ward told us. He said, don't say, a, don't breathe a bloody word of it. But the guys who came down and checked out, the, the road manager came and checked out the gear and said, it's all fine, you know, we knew that day, so. So I was there as soon as that concert was over, right at a good front spot, you know, and it was great. Peterson called us, bartender, Johnny Pence. Leave the nail, get your fucking asses down here because Aerosmith's gonna be down here. She was on there. I really didn't think they were going to show up. I went to the Aerosmith concert, and as we were leaving, someone said, oh, we're going to be at the pop room. I said, yeah, Jackal's going to be at the pop room. I'm not going down there. I didn't think they were going to show, so we started our next set, <clears throat> and I look over. I was on stage left, so I look over to my left, and right behind the stack, I see fucking Kurt Loader's looking up at me. After playing the fourth show of their Get a Grip Tour at the Sioux Falls, South Dakota Arena, Aerosmith somehow found enough energy to come here to the Pomp Room downtown in Sioux Falls to play an after-hour set that went like this. Before you know it, there's all these people coming into the club. I mean, like within 10 minutes, the cl club was packed. <laughs> We have people stomping on top of everything, unplugging this and unplugging that. People everywhere, an absolute flood of humans. When I got there, I had to crawl underneath the one between the two stacks, and I stand up, and <laughs> there's Steven Tyler. <laughs> go, hey! He goes, hey! Because <laughs> Steve Tyler came down, got up on the stage. He asked me if I had a harmonica. I don't know why. So I figured, if why would you want to blow someone else's harmonica, you know? Um, and we were playing, right? and I'm like, I couldn't really talk. I was trying to concentrate, not fuck up in front of Steve Tyler, you know? But then after the song was over, uh, they come out and they play, and it was like, it was one of those moments, man, I almost felt like crying. I almost started crying. I was, it was like, I was so starstruck. Handing Tom Hamilton my bass, you know, to, to play. It was weird and surreal. I got it back, and he put a chip in it, man. It was, <laughs> I know, it was totally by accident, but there <laughs> He must have just bumped into the, like, just right to one of the pieces of drum hardware somewhere, something. But, yeah, I didn't care about that. That's my Tom Hamilton chip, man. There's so many people, and nobody can see what they're doing. It's dark. And... We'd lose the monitors. And Steven Tyler, uh, in his most professional way as possible, would look over at me and go, oh, shit. <laughs> I'd have to crawl over a couple of people and plug my amp rack back into the wall and the monitors would come back up and he would go on. It happened three or four times. And, and nobody out front ever had a clue anything was wrong. He's that good. I would say we were in our element, you know, it's like people were right up in my face. Um, that's kind of like where we came from. It was pretty impressive, the whole thing was, because they, they were pretty much at the top of their game right then. And then on the way out, standing there, I look over, and I'm standing next to Joe Perry. It just happens. I go, hey, I go, I'm John, this is our bar, you know, thanks a lot for doing this. Joe Perry shakes my hand and goes, well, thanks for letting us. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right now, this is good. Joe Perry just thanked me for letting him play the pop room for nothing. All right, <laughs> this is good. The famous people are pretty much just like normal people. Uh, some of them are very outgoing and fun, and some of them aren't. If you're 
going to be a miserable human being and you're famous, it doesn't make any difference. You're still a miserable human being. <laughs> Sometimes you had a week off, you had some days off, and you could see the other local bands. You could see a lot of national artists. There are literally thousands that played the Pomp Room. The best musicians in the world showing up to play there. At the time, it was pretty common for the people that played. Billy Squire, I, I partied with him all night. Metallica came down at two different times. The first time they were here, they were kind of an underground thing. It wasn't a big deal. The second time they were here, it was a big deal. But check it out. Somebody told me that there's a club here called the fucking uh, Pop Room or some shit like that. The place was absolutely jam-packed, and here they show up, and it was it was kind of crazy. We didn't have security, not not for something like that, because at, at that time they were, you know, they were they were at the superstar status. But it, it all went well, you know. I sat at the bar with Lars, and he was going to buy the place. <laughs> Warrant came down, and I ran into Janie Lane in the bathroom. And you know how it is, the pleasantries. Hey, you guys sound great. Yeah, hey, nice to see you, man. You guys, I heard you guys did great tonight at the arena. And I just threw it out. You know, you guys want to get up and play at all? God, yeah. <laughs> so I, there were like three of the members were there, and we got up and played for about 45 minutes with them and just jammed whatever we wanted. Or Bad Company came in one night, you know, just couple unannounced. guys from Bad Company? And, and got up and, and did, uh, you know... Feel like making love and yeah. a couple of, yeah. And uh, Shooting Star. I mean, they got up and did that stuff. And then afterwards, invited us to go party at the hotel. We had Jake the Snake <laughs> and the, Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man, both come out and get on stage. There was a girl that, you yeah, know, we had them singing them with us. Yep. Yeah. In the pop room, Sunday night, or Saturday night, the Monkees played at the Raceway. The Monkees come in, uh, Davy Jones comes into the bar. Smashed off his ass, short little British cat. And Jeannie's behind the bar. And he's being belligerent, you know, and he's drunk, and he's sloshing around, and he's saying, ah. And you know, Davy's a really, really nice guy, but he's known to tip a few. Now, granted, most, you know, bartenders would have let it slide a little more of that, but Jeannie was there that night. He's gesturing and he knocks over a drink. You know, Jeannie's there, you know, bartender cleans it up, Jeannie kind of looks. Now it happens again. Jeannie gave him a warning, you know, one more and you're gonna have to go. You know, he was, oh, okay. And going on, and sure enough, a few minutes later, knocks over one more. And he says, no, nope, sir, I'm sorry, you've had too much. You, you just, you've had too much to drink. And in full Arthur mode, he turns and says, but don't you know who I am? And Jeannie turns to him and says, Obviously, you don't know who I am. Brunzi? And they bum-rushed him right out the door. We toyed around with a few things on the, on the small stage. Nazareth, we did Great White on the small stage. But what we were constantly told was we need to move the stage to the other end and get, so we could use the length of the building and get the width of the stage. We moved the stage down there, which enabled us to do bigger shows, but the bar local atmosphere and feel for the place was way diminished, and we never got it back. There was pluses and minuses, and I think everyone felt it, you know. We lost some of that intimacy, having that short throw and everyone right there, mm -hmm. but turning it that way allowed allowed more people to come in, which allowed us to hire bigger acts. As it went on, they started, Ward especially, started booking a lot more nationals. At that point, we now have the ability to do the larger shows, and I had enough production to do them, not to do them comfortably. We could, we could survive. I needed about twice as much PA, but we needed about twice as much building to do most of the stuff we were trying to do. And eventually, bought a PV... Mark III, soundboard, and everything went bananas after that. You'd sound check at the pomp room, and it could take like two hours, you know? But then you go to the entry, and it would take three minutes, you know? And like, you're done, you hear everything, you're done, you know? And then at the pomp room, John would be, 
Don't just wait. You know, wait a second. It was like the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> something was smoking. Something wasn't turned on. By the time I left working there, it was just a, a, a real mix of bands. Jeannie and Dwayne were long out of the bar. It was their children that were running the bar. And the mix-up was something that they preferred doing. Ward was really into blues and not just like the Stevie Ray Vaughan you know, what's on the radio. Uh, they had Luther Allison. I remember those being some really great shows. And that's, you know, and that's what was great about the Palmer. I mean, you, see, you could see someone like that, you could see someone like Cheap Trick, and you could see someone like the Super Suckers all within like a couple months of each other. Once they did start having one night shows and national entertainment coming through them, and there were so many great shows that went so, through there. But towards the end, just the variety of music that they had, and, the amount, I mean, everybody used to go there. So you get to meet all the other people from different types of bands. And that's kind of what's fun. And that's kind of what's, I guess, missing in music now. Everything is so much like, I only like this kind of music and I'm only gonna go hang out with people who like this kind of music too into a place that does this. Where so it was kind of a big melting pot. Yeah, I really admire them for staying open. I mean, every night of the week and you could just go down there on a Wednesday and see some ridiculously obscure touring band. Like when I started hanging out there in the 90s, I mean, you could see anything down there. You'd sure. see, I saw a Kiss tribute band with like 30 people and the full pyro and everything. The Buckwheat Zydeco. Was Los there, Lobos. Uh, Los Lobos. So uh, done that. Re, yeah, just a really eclectic mix of music. Any local musician could be found there on any given night hanging out and it was just, you know, it was like a meeting place and a, and a showcase and just, just a collective melting pot of everything to do with music in town. So you might have reggae on Tuesday and blues on Wednesday and uh, Closet Monster on Friday and Saturday and Janitor Bob the next weekend. You gotta take another step and you can't go lighter, really. Live music, you can't go, well, we're gonna be a little less exciting than we were last week this week. You're gonna love it, you know, it don't work that way. So you went, we went a little heavier. We went from, become, from being a bar to becoming a venue. <laughs> you, know, you can't do that seven nights a week. You can do that four nights a month. I don't know. You don't go to a venue every night. Otherwise, there was no other venue in town unless somebody like John Stever wanted to rent out the Coliseum or something like that. He had... The city didn't like him renting out places like that. You, you wouldn't believe the hoops he went through to, just to get the violent femmes of all people. Ward was willing to, to try something different and he was willing to run with it as long as it worked for him. Dad had a theory. Fill up the dance floor with girls and everything else takes care of itself. Well, as we know, that works. Another thing happened there. Instead of filling up the dance floor with pretty girls, the grunge seemed to fill it up with Sweaty guys. And there's, there's not a lot of people that go, hey, let's run down to the bar. There's a bunch of sweaty guys knocking each other on the floor down there. It's great. It doesn't really happen. And that was a big change. But that particular type of music was what was becoming the mainstay for radio play stuff. So what do you do? If you look at what was happening in 87, 88, 89, a lot of indie rock, a lot of alternative, quote, alternative stuff was starting to creep into the mainstream. At the time that that was happening here, every city was seeing the same thing. I mean, that's what, the Portland scene sprang up, the Seattle scene, obviously, Athens, Georgia. And that was before alternative met Eddie Vedder vocal styles. I mean, it was like Liz Fair replaced with Husker Du. I mean, they were getting commercial airplay. So the normals, as I like to call them, we're starting to listen to weird music. That's why some of the hair band crowd was going away. That's why the dance crowd was going away. But it was a big, big thing when Janitor Bob got that pomp room show. We all knew that the hair band thing was starting to die. Janitor Bob moving over there was like the first blast. We, we knew something was gonna happen then. Big hair and leather was giving way to flannel-clad local acts. The Roots Rock vibe of Violet consistently packed the place. 
while the hippie grunge sound of Janitor Bob and the Armchair Cowboys gained the group a rabid fan base at the Pomp Room. Some were regulars, lots were college kids, most were sweaty guys. It was certainly interesting to go and play there at the initial because it was such, it had that metal bar kind of persona and then we show up and we're not metal. I could see the, the look in the crowd of the people that did go there all the time were kind of like, what are they doing here? Until, until we won them over. Both Janitor Bob and Violet could pack the place. The Violet crowd was a little mellower, but still a good crowd, you know. They started having national touring acts come in there and we'd play there fairly regularly, you know, every couple, three months or whatever. It was, it became the hangout. It became the place to be. I mean, almost always something going on and all of a sudden the, the local scene that may have been a little bit more spread out, you know, had, you know, kind of a place to play. And there were other bands that were local that were getting stage time maybe that hadn't been before, that were, you know, getting a chance to, to play somewhere. And Even the posters changed. They used to put out a poster that was a calendar every month and then they would print it every month with the acts that were coming. And uh, it used to be a lot of, you know, one stretch things, but next thing you know, you see the weekends, you got Janitor Bob here, you got Violet here, you got another band here, you got another band here, and then multiple nights during the week, you now suddenly have Jason and the Scorchers and suddenly have, you know, Steve Fobert. They got to play a one-nighter on a Tuesday, but it was an open night, they got stage time, they got to work on their chops, and it was a it was a almost a cultural shift where it wasn't just, you know, about being a biker bar or a rough place or, you know, it was a live music club, but it became a much bigger bigger concept of a live music club, just boom. Part of that explosion included the punk rock scene cultivated by Terry Taylor. Terry started playing and booking shows as a teenager, creating a thriving punk rock community that brought bands like Green Day, Jawbreaker, and No Effects to the basement of Nordic Hall. We started playing some punk rock shows, and bands that we played with that were from out of town started telling people that I book shows even though I wasn't booking things at the time when I was 15. They just gave, I think I was a little more social. So they just started telling people that I book shows. And next thing I know, Green Day's getting a hold of me, The Offspring, um, a lot of punk rock bands, uh, Christ on a Crutch, which those guys are in the Foo Fighters now. And my phone just started ringing off the hook. Within a couple of years, I was doing all these Nordic Hall shows that were just doing four or 500 kids a show. Terry Taylor was the patron saint of any noisy rock and roll that appealed to anyone under 21 years old. The guy would put his car on the line for any individual show. He pawned his own car so many times, he probably ended up paying three times what it was worth. He cared, all he cared about was the music. All he cared about was bringing the shows. He didn't care if he made a penny, and most of the time he didn't. We did a lot of shows with Terry. And, you know, if you talk to Terry Taylor, he's very quiet. His dad was an officer. Uh, very polite. Soft-spoken. And then he, he gets on stage and he goes crazy. I go, okay, listen now. You got to quit busting everything. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Taylor's dedication to providing a drug and alcohol-free venue made a strong music scene in Sioux Falls. But the 20-year-old soon got caught up in controversy. Some people became concerned about teens and adults mixing at all ages events. Initial complaints had nothing to do with Terry, but his Nordic Hall shows soon got drug into the mix. Despite pleas from bands, fans, parents, and Taylor himself, the city imposed a dance ordinance that threatened to kill all ages shows across Sioux Falls. Nordic Hall wasn't really an option anymore. The city had kind of put the kibosh on kind of the independent booking of halls and they enforced this whole dance ordinance thing. It was a huge ordeal. And then Ward came to me early November one time. I was like, hey, I heard you're having a little bit of trouble doing some of your shows, you know, I know what you've done. I know what you've done for the city. We'd love to have you involved in the pomp room and we'll take care of these other, these issues you've been having because you're going to be with an established club that's been a staple in the city for 25 plus years. And I was just like, 
I knew it was going to be the beginning of a of a new era for what I was doing. Terry was always the the underground kid doing great stuff, and when he was able to get, you know, he was doing garage shows and house shows, and when he was able to start booking some things at the Pomp, when they became receptive, that was kind of the cultural change. Mm-hmm. He was able to get a foot in there, and a, I mean, he didn't just he knocked the door wide open and started bringing in really cool bands. We had kind of a fight. We were in the Pomp room, and. The idea the city had of, you want to let us let a bunch of kids into the pomp room? Have you lost your marbles? So, but they, we managed to get around. We had to put all the booze away. There was no booze anywhere. There was no armband stuff. We didn't do that because city, that would, they weren't, they weren't going to go that far with this. Stuff that Ward normally yep. wouldn't bring in. He'd bring in some of that, that real obscure punkish grunge stuff. Dumpster juice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Stuff that you'd, ne- you'd never hear anywhere else. It, it was I great. I those kids. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a lot of fun. We had a Skank and Pickle. Those guys, uh, you couldn't stand there and not enjoy that. I think just the energy. It's, it was a young crowd. Definitely a young, all-ages crowd. It's not just a, it's not a well-behaved, like, ska dance party. It was, it was a punk show. People were going off. It felt like, okay. This energy is real, and these kids are letting it out. Gore. It was a show that I was dreading to do because of I thought it was going to be an absolute disaster. <laughs> Those guys, because we had to cover everything because they, they spit blood all over, which is uh, corn syrup and, and red food dye is what makes up the blood. Well, they spit it all over everything, so it's sticky. You cover everything all up. Afterwards, I, I told them, I said, you know, I didn't want to do this show because I, I thought it was going to be a complete disaster. I didn't have so much fun. They birthed an alien on stage, for God's sakes. You know, one of the first big ones, the um, Danzig, Marilyn Manson, and Corn Show. They had these big, huge lighting pod things, you know, big part of their show. You know, we got to get it in. Wouldn't fit in any of the doors. So right off the bat, they're, they're not real happy, you know, with the whole situation. The other opening acts would have been Korn on their very first tour and Marilyn Manson on their first tour. Well, Marilyn Manson, part of his behavior is he spits all over the crowd. Well, he'd spit on me, and so I went and dressed myself up in plastic bags, and basically I was coated completely in, in plastic and stood out in the, uh, we were part of the pit, catching people, stood out there taunting him to uh, keep spitting on me, which which he did. And suddenly Ma and I started feeling things hit us in the back. Something hits him on the shoulder. <laughs> Wrong guy to hit. Looks up. Don't do that. <laughs> and we turned around and he was hawking loogies at us because uh, we were security and he was anti-establishment. Well, nobody told us he was going to do this, and I took a little bit of offense and... Spits again. Bokey turns around and goes, one more fucking time, I'm going to kick your fucking ass. Turns back around. Sure enough, right towards the end of the show, gets him again. Pokey's calm, takes it. I waited until after the show and walked back where the dressing area was and picked him up by the throat and explained to him that he'd have a wonderful job managing a McDonald's if I squeezed. It took the road manager, the crew, and John Ertz to pull him off of him. He felt really bad about it later on, and their management guy brought this huge box of shirts and hats for everybody. A whole box of merchandise for not killing Marilyn because they depended on him for a paycheck. So they were happy that he'd survived it. Needless to say, the experience left John with a bad impression of Marilyn Manson. He said, those fuckers were weird. From the minute they walked off the bus to the minute they left, he said, even if I could get them today for the same amount of money I paid from them, I would not have those fuckers back. They're strange, they're weird, and there's just no reason to have them. But eight months later, Manson returned to headline the Pomp Room. Ward booked the show, and tickets sold out even faster. He is no different from Kiss from my era or Elvis in the 50s, Ward later told a reporter. You get out of it what you want to. It was a completely different setting. 
It gave us the opportunity to introduce the place to a crowd that never would have seen it. For the most part, uh, we, we provided uh, you know, a pretty safe environment, and uh, we didn't have... I don't remember any trouble at any of those shows. I really don't remember any trouble at any of those shows. But Ward saw his future customers. You know, he's like going, hey, you know, we're having music, we're doing music stuff. We've got future customers here if we bring these other bands in because Terry had a great cred for uh, bringing in national acts and other all-ages shows by allowing the time that they're not operating as a bar to be able to get them in there. What a fantastic idea. All we had to do as bartenders was pull the bottles, get them downstairs. And Ward and I actually had many talks about that. The theory was that to get them used to coming to the pop room to see all ages shows when they hit 21, there's the next generation. When you talk about growing up, you know, in South Dakota and musically you're into something a little bit different, what Terry Taylor and Ward Ertz did at that point to make the bigger shows accessible, to give it a place to go, to make tickets easy to buy, to have good production behind it instead of being in a garage or at the Nordic Hall, Love the Nordic Hall and the history of the Nordic Hall, but these were revolutionary for this town, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Fugazi, Acid Bath, Less Than Jake, Neurosis. They and other bands spread the Pomp Room's reputation as an all-ages venue throughout South Dakota and beyond. Kids drove hours to see bands they already loved or were about to fall for. A new generation was welcomed in through Pomp Room doors. It felt special, right? Like, I knew it was probably a place where other people belonged, like it was their scene or whatever. I didn't feel like I belonged there. I felt like I was special. I was like, this is, this is cool. This is something. I assume it's kind of like what I've heard about CBGBs, that it wasn't that it was a punk venue, it was that they would book anything. So they ended up booking these punk acts and it became known for that. Standing outside the pomp room and there's all these kids who look like me and there's this loud music and you walk in and it's all dirty and fucked up and I was like, this is it, this is my spot. Friends of Friends had mentioned there's some shows, all ages, we should go check them out and uh, we went down there and it was instantly sucked in. It's just like, it was like immediately like, when are we going again? When are we doing this again? Like, can we go tomorrow? Can we go next week? Like who's playing? I don't care, we need to go there. Just kids were just filing in. I, I didn't know how people would be receptive to the new venue with a not the best image for parents at the time. I love the venue, you know, but, um, you know, there's a perception. You know, being an all ages show, there was a bar and I was just like, we just walk right by it. There was like the lower area and you'd see the bar and there was nothing happening there. Um, there's like, oh, this is where the old people hang out when they're listening to Aerosmith or whatever lame shit they've got going on. That's closed. I think it helped change the perception of the pomp room too, because it was again, known as the biker bar, whatever. But then it became like the premier all ages venue in Sioux Falls that Sioux Falls was needing. I mean, the kids were stupid, but they were, dumb stupid you could deal with them they there there was very little respect but there was a point where it was like okay yes sir and they would they would cringe and listen to every word she said the not all ages show there was a point where alcohol made people not want to listen to a word you said and i always thought it was harder to handle the crowds for the non all ages than the all ages whoever the band was supposed to play that night canceled and Johnny Ertz like, hey, why don't you guys play? We could pay you like 150 bucks. <laughs> and to us, cause like doing the, the all ages punk rock thing, you were like lucky if the whole band got like 50 bucks. We're just like, wow, we're gonna get like 50 bucks a piece. It's gonna be awesome. Our first show at the Pomp Room was opening for Less Than Jake and uh, Blink-182, which was a band nobody had heard of. Dude Ranch had just came out. Blink-182 hadn't, hadn't blown up yet. Um, but of course, right after that tour, they blow up and it's just ginormous. The funny part is nobody I know watched that set because we played and then everybody went outside for a while and then we came back in to watch Less Than Jake. Suicide Machines in a Veil was one of the last shows I did. And that was one of the shows where um, everyone was stage diving. I remember that show got so out of hand as far as kids stage diving and moshing, I literally thought someone was gonna die. I remember standing in the back being like, this is anarchy. Like, 
just because it was so intense and a kid did break his ankle at that one and I ended up paying a ton out of my pocket. I think I made about $800 at that show and ended up paying out another 3000 in medical expenses for this kid. I hit a low with the pomp room for a bit where I was, I was booking too many shows. So there was a lot of learning curves that went with doing stuff at the pomp room, but they were always so hospitable about, we want this to work. We want this to work with you. Um, even the few all ages shows they tried to do on their own that Ward booked, he would he was like, call me. He's like, well, hey, I'm going to book Goldfinger. Um, but I want you to run the door. I want you to market it. I want you involved. So they always did everything they could to make it work for me. I felt sort of relief, you know, like walking through the doors at the pump room, like this is a show. I felt like this, these are my people. I feel comfortable here. I can say what I want. I can be who I am. I go down to the pump room. I run, I'm going to run into... Whoever, you know, guys I'm playing with the band at the time. Um, I mean, I met girlfriends there, people I dated for a long time. I met longtime friends there. I mean, I just feel like there was a community involved. Just a few things that stick out in my mind is just the, the, the griminess and the rawness of it. But I think the beauty that came from that was that it didn't matter what that was. It was the music and the community that kind of brought it all together and that ended up being the beauty of it. Watching some of those emo bands and, and some of those punk bands, like I, I remember the Promise Ring in Texas is the reason, just bands that stick out that I listen to today and, and, and give me chills to this day. And I think what, I didn't know what I had back then. At the time, I, you know, I thought, whatever, I'm just a kid that likes music, you know? And looking back and reflecting, it's like, we had something amazing here. The Pomp Room was the place that I fell in love with music. And so that that culture was kind of like, I don't know, a couple hours of I'm at home. Those days where we played, playing with my best friends in the Pomp Room, just going to a show, going to the frying pan afterwards. Those were literally some of the best days of my life. The same stage where Guar sprayed kids in blood, Manson covered staff in spit. And fans of all ages came to find a sweaty sense of musical community. That stage was about to introduce adult patrons to the Pomp Room's new unofficial house band. They were called the Glory Holes, and they played disco. It was originally going to have a different concept each time. But before we decided to do that, we did a couple shows and the crowd started building up. It was doing well. And then we go, what can we do for Halloween? Well, there's too many members, we can't do KISS. You know, what can we dress up as? Disco. You know, I kind of tossed it out there, and everyone went, yeah, and I went, oh, okay. Let's, let's see what happens here. The Cartwright Brothers, <laughs> with the Bastard Brother JT. <laughs> so they join us. Don't think that wasn't a weird phone call. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we're putting together this disco thing and uh, we want you guys to play the Bee Gees and the Village People. Sure. I remember the one time Glory Holes go on stage and we had not moved all the tables out of the road and the chairs. And I'm standing back there and I can see the stage just fine. And the band started and everybody stepped up on the tables and the chairs. and. Not only couldn't I see the stage, I couldn't hear it. I had absolute, I was standing behind the soundboard going, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> we were well over capacity at a Glory Hole show and people were buying cases of beer at a time at the bar because there was no way they could get back there. You used to see them selling <laughs> cases of beer from the bar and they'd yeah. be going back to someone in the back there. And they'd Pass them along, yeah. so you, you couldn't get back to the bar. Before the holes, I used to think Janitor Bob, Bob was the crowd that yep. was uncontrollable and would destroy a bar. Not until the holes, the whole building would start, start bouncing. bouncing. All you see are the heads doing this. <laughs> feel a concrete floor and you can feel, feel it, it move. move. Because yep. there were so many people bouncing in time together. It was beautiful. I'm pretty positive people were just peeing on the floor where they stood because there was no way they could get to the bathroom. And the fire marshal came up and said, we're, we're shutting it down because I think it was double capacity, if I remember correctly. I think they looked at the crowd and realized what a shutting it down would cost.
cause more of a situation. So they, the cops actually didn't show up until 1.30. But I do remember looking over in, in Ward going, you know, like, last mm -hmm. song. You know, I look over at Monitor World and Snoop. And, last song, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. look at my watch, you know. <laughs> you know finish, they get towards the end of that, and I look over, and there's a, there's they gotta be five, six cops <laughs> with him in a line. I'm like, oh, I get it, okay. <laughs> Wrap her up. <laughs> but I went in to pick up my guitar and amp the next day, and they were down to three cases of beer in the cooler. And there was not a flat surface anywhere in the bar that didn't have glasses or bottles on them. There Every flat surface. No flat surface. The tops of the doors were covered with empty glasses and beer bottles. Every place that you could sit and empty in that huge place had an empty on it. It was awesome. I've never seen a bar in that amount of disrepair at the end of a show anywhere other than at the end of Glory Hole show. Kids were moshing, adults were dancing, bands across the country knew the pomp room by name, but the building was falling apart. Business could be great one night and lousy the rest of the week. Rumors had circulated for years that the pomp room would be closing. In 1998, the rumor became all too real. After 27 years of Earth's family ownership, the pomp room was closing forever. You know, everybody goes, why did the pomp room close? Well, here's the deal. The place, there was five old buildings slammed together. Uh, the infrastructure was shot, uh, electrical, plumbing, ceilings, roofs, everything. The places, uh, some of them were built, oh, the one building dated from the 20s. Uh, I think some of them were built in the 40s. And they were, it was a maintenance disaster at times. And we were pretty hard on them too. And for a long time, you know, you go, okay, we can put a band-aid on this, fix this. I said, well, we should get out of downtown. We should move. And, they're, and it's like, well, in order to do that, you need a lot of money. Plus, mom and dad wanted me out of the business because <laughs> I enjoy it way too much. So, you know, uh, there was, their thinking was to, uh, uh, they, you know, we better save him. Thanks, mom, dad. <laughs> so did they save me? I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> a lot of the, the core crowd of the pomp room was aging out of going out every night. They're starting to have kids. They're starting to, you know. They're on their third DWI, whatever it is, you know, they just <laughs> they just quit going out every as much as they once did. And I mean they did the all ages shows and everything and they'd have a packed house on a Sunday. But you can only make so much money selling Coca-Cola, you know. Their entertainment dollar is spread thin now. I mean, you have so many options. Before all you really had was, hey, it's a weekend, let's go drink beer somewhere and listen to some loud shit. Now you get a liquor license and you just pop the lottery machines in and you don't have to service anything, you don't have to do any work. You just sit there and take money. It destroyed music because now bar owners are not club owners anymore. Now they're just bar managers. For it being what it was, what it meant to the city and, and the citizenry and the music fans and stuff, boy, it sure seemed like the city officials hated that place. Yeah. The police presence was really heavy. I felt like the city did everything they could to make the pomp room not work. They just didn't want to deal with the element, and it seemed like the cops showed up a lot, especially at all ages shows and did walkthroughs. And that's not something the kids that came to my shows were used to. Before the bar would disappear forever, there needed to be one last party, a sweaty, stinky extravaganza to say goodbye the only way folks knew how. One last party. And the glory holes would provide the soundtrack to the final call. That would be probably one of the cheerier funerals I've been to in a long time. <laughs> night, the saddest night, 
I mean, it was it was packed, and it was nothing but tears. <laughs> As I looked around at the bartenders, and and Sumat was there and stuff, and I saw all of them were like me. We all had tears in our eyes because that summed it up, and we were all going to miss it a lot. We're all going to miss it a lot. It was an honor to be involved in the last night there, but um, very, very emotional night. And that all changed when I saw Ma Wyatt peeing off the stage. American Pie was the last song played in the pomp room, the night the music died. I will always remember the Cartwrights playing the day the music died and crying as I, as I was massaging the wall because I was gonna miss the old lady. We got in the back room and it was quiet. And Amy's crying and I have tears in my eyes. Everybody had tears in their eyes and it was just like, is this really over? This can't be over, you know? And that, that was the most memorable thing. And it wasn't necessarily a good memory, but it was, Profound, you know? Yeah, very profound. So I was there for a little while. I said goodbye to the crowd from the stage, and I left. On March 13, 2000, the five buildings that had become a musical mecca for multiple generations were torn down. 215 North Dakota Avenue is now a parking ramp for a nearby bank. We closed the doors the first day of 99, last day of 98. It sat there for a year and three months. It just sat there. So I think we sold it to a private uh, group of investors. The city, they never offered to buy it. They, they never, there was no, there was no legal reason we had to close. Uh, there was never any, there was never anything like that. People are always going to play and they'll always find a place to do it. Um. I, I do miss that place, though. I mean, I just miss the sound of that room. Every once in a while, I'll be driving down Minnesota Avenue, I'll get to 8th and Min, and I'll look over there to see who's on the sign. Well, the sign's been gone a long time. The pop room's been gone a long time, but I still, it's just a reaction I have, because I would always do that when they were open. Nothing had that longevity. There were, there were clubs that were really cool that yeah. came around for a couple of years, a few years maybe, and then went away. No matter what building you put it in, no matter what you try to do, you'll never capture that era in that kind of building again. It just floated away. It's like the scene floated away. The pop door, room doors closed, and you got about a six year, seven year gap where there was nothing. I think everybody knew when, when the pomp room closed that even if, even if there was gonna be something that could take its place, it wouldn't have the same history, and we were just losing something that that was a huge chunk of, of history. It's one of those things that being young and dumb, you don't know what you have when you're kind of going through it. And I remember thinking like, ah, oh, that's a bummer. But I know, you know, we'll get another venue and places, will, you know, shows will be good and it'll be, you know, just kind of how it is. And that's, that's that. As I'm going into corporate America, I'm parking in this lot thinking, F you guys. <laughs> I am now having to park here to go to work versus getting drunk here and going to an awesome show. And it was just, it kind of got me in a pissy attitude every day. <laughs> I don't know what the scene is like in Sioux Falls in 2021. I'm, I'm guessing it's very different than it was 20, 26 years ago. That could be in relation to people getting older, different interests, and the fact that the pomp room doesn't exist anymore. There was nothing quite like it afterwards, but I remember feeling like, oh shit, this is going away. This is gone, this, this feeling is gone, These, this scene is gone or whatever. And then it sort of came back and I don't know, I think about that a lot. I think about the baseline that it sort of created because if it weren't for that, if people didn't have that feeling, if it weren't like so, so visceral, like being in that space and it weren't so meaningful, would you do the work that it takes to set up a DIY show if you didn't know how great it was? You know, if it weren't such a great space, if there weren't so many shows, if there weren't so many memories made there, if it were just sort of a half-assed place, or it was maybe a house show here and a house show there, there was like, 
there was some kind of unity. We were all losing something. We were all losing a, a venue to book at, to play at. Our friends, like some of those people had been there for 25 years. Like, what were they going to go do? But I also knew it was going to be a changing point for the city of Sioux Falls because we were losing our only established music venue. They had staff that counted on them to pay them. They had people's livelihoods in their hands. And when shows underperformed, or even on the nights they'd just be open as like a drinking establishment and they don't cover their house nut in bar sales, I mean, that's a lot of stress. I mean, I, I saw almost the deterioration of Ward in that respect, and it was heartbreaking. It was uh, uh, such a huge part of my life. Um, uh, and I, and I, I can tell myself over and over and over, okay, you know this is gonna happen. You knew it was, you knew it was, it was inevitable. Uh, look at what is here today and could we compete with some of the other brand new clubs? And uh, when, you, when you're working with, literally working with stuff that's falling apart. It was a difference to have a, a, a 55 Chevy and a, and a brand new Camaro. You know, you, you, you love the Chevy, you got to, but it, it doesn't have air conditioning and it's not a brand new Camaro. You know, you've got your people that went, oh my God, I would never step foot in that place. Oh my God, you stuck to the carpet. Oh, it was the grossest place ever. And then there's people like us that, you know, would give anything to have it back. It was a dive, it was a dump, you know? Was it a beautiful place? Absolutely not. It was beautiful to us. It's just hard to believe that there'll ever be a club like that in my lifetime yep. that will be that much fun that so many people have memories of. We were lucky enough to have a playground like the Pomp Room. And that's what it was, it was a playground for musicians. It was all heart. It was, the building had a soul of its own. You walked in and you felt it, it was, it was what rock and roll really is. It was loud, ugly, not going away. A rock club is built more on the dirt and the grunge in the carpet and the, and the echoing band from last week than anything else, you know? I mean, that's what makes a rock club and that's what made the pomp room. But you don't realize how, how cool of a place and a family it was until it's gone. Probably my favorite place we ever played. Yeah. yeah in all true. the years we... Yeah. And we had a band for 20 years that performed, so... Mm. And there was never another pomp room. Nothing no. even close. No. No. If I was describing it to somebody my age, I think they would get it. It was loud as hell and a lot of fun. I think they would get that because they can remember when things were that way. If I was trying to, trying to describe it to somebody younger, let's say 20... I don't think they would get it. I couldn't say anything to get them to understand. There's nothing I could say. This dingy little old rock and roll place changed my life for the better in more ways than I can ever explain. And I think it brought music, art, and culture together in, in such a beautiful way that I wish everyone could experience it. It felt like such a special place, like maybe more special than we deserved in South Dakota. And I feel like that helped propel the scene along after it closed and people were like willing to do the work that it took to, you know, bring DIY shows to Sioux Falls. But that kind of extended into the future. Like I'll run into people or I'll hear about people or I'll read about people or I'll go to someone's restaurant or I'll go to an art gallery, people I've never met before. And I'll find out that they were pomp room kids. They were pomp room people. The people who have made the city a better place, you know, the people who are real creative people, people who are doing podcasts, people who started bands, people who who are now sound engineers, you know, the people behind the boards and managing venues and stuff. Those are pomp room kids. It all comes down to the common thread is not Republicans or Democrats or white or black or all those things, it's music. And the pomp room is famous for music. Now a lot of cities, they almost have grants for venues to keep them going. And I wish Sioux Falls back then would have stepped up to the plate more to make a venue like the Pomp Room succeed and stay because I feel like 
if the pomp room was still around still around to this day and it had never closed, I feel like it would it would be a um, world renowned venue stop. That would be legendary status like a lot of a lot of cities have. And with Sioux Falls musical history, I feel like it's a shame we don't have something like that that we could you know, it sucks we have to do a documentary about the pomp room rather than hanging out at the pomp room. <laughs> it was the perfect place for that moment in time in my life. And they say you can never go back home again, and that's because home changes. And so you can never go back to that spot, to that moment. But at that time, that was exactly where I wanted to be. It's the sort of thing that it just doesn't happen by accident. And it was, it was a lot about... The, you know, mostly about the people, you know, starting out with my mom and dad, and the, the stage that they set. Um, I don't really know, I can't explain it. All I can know is that uh, it happened, and I was there for the whole thing, and now it was more fun than anybody could possibly imagine. Smelled terrible. I wish they had quit smoking. Governor? Senator! Oh, how are you? Where'd you get that? I just brought it for you. Well, thank you. I'll right. filibuster that right now. Oh. Well, I guess I don't need that. It's popping. Yeah, now it's not too far. It's not the way it goes to do. But if you try to change your mind, I know you're That's the guy that fucking stank eyed us every time we walked through the door. <laughs> I don't know whether he hated all ages shows, hated kids or just looked like that, but I remember thinking that guy was gonna hit us with a beer bottle if we came too close to the bar. And he started doing some things with sound and Pogi and all those guys and then, then it all just went haywire. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, out of control. <laughs>
can't yeah. get high till you say goodbye, so get the fuck out. <laughs>